as I said, at the start of each lecture, I am going to remind you that we're going to see a lot of reaction mechanisms. But don't be put off by that. There aren't really lots of reaction mechanisms. There are a few. We're just going to show you lots of examples of them. And there are some slight subtle differences, but predominantly it's the same thing. <coughs> so most of them are going to be either attack of a charged nucleophile onto an uncharged carbonyl. So here is our charged nucleophile. This is our uncharged carbonyl. Okay, we're going to get that nucleophilic attack. And remember, the carbon in the carbonyl is the thing that's electron deficient. So you either get this charged nucleophile, so a very strong nucleophile, versus a standard carbonyl group, or you're going to get the lone pair of electrons of an uncharged nucleophile. So that's down here. We've got this lone pair of electrons. Okay. That's going to attack a carbonyl group that's been activated in some way. So normally, predominantly, that's by protonation of the oxygen. You will see there are one or two other examples that we'll look at later on, but it's predominantly showing that there is some kind of positive charge on that oxygen. Okay, So that's summing up the first lecture that we did. And that really is, that's the key thing. Get that into your head and everything else will make a little bit more sense and be a little bit, more, a little bit easier. So what we're going to do now is start looking at some examples. So we're going to take the stuff that we did before was a standard nucleophile. But this time we're going to look at a specific example. So we're going to start looking at oxygen as the nucleophile. So if we were to take oxygen as a nucleophile, the classic oxygen that we can use is an alcoholic, a hydroxyl oxygen. Okay? And if you add that to an aldehyde or a ketone, you produce what's called a hemiacetal. Okay? And that is usually by an acid-catalyzed mechanism. So let's start, let's have a look at what that would be then. So an aldehyde, you have one carbon group and one hydrogen attached to your carbonyl. So you've got a hydrogen there as well. Okay, so we need to add a proton to it. So we're going to have its acid catalyzed. So therefore we have H plus. And we are going to react our oxygen with that proton. So we're going to do that electrophilic stage first. We're going to add a proton to um, our reaction mechanism. Now, what you'll see, because we spoke at the very last bit of the lecture this morning about reversibility. So before I was just showing you a single arrow. We just had one arrow going from one thing to another. That denotes that one species is being transferred or changed into another. Now in this one, we don't have that. We have two arrows. We have one going one way, one going the other. I'm using this kind of half arrow because that's the same as you'll see in the book, but equally you can see it that people will write a full arrow one way, a full arrow the other. But what this is denoting is an equilibrium. What it's saying is we recognise that that protonation can happen, but equally deprotonation can happen. The hydrogen, can, that proton can be removed and you can go back to where you started from. So a lot of these experiments, a lot of these reaction mechanisms are reversible, but what we just need to be aware of is that's going to be going on all the time. But at some point, we're going to, in the equilibrium, we're going to hit the structure that we need, the intermediate that we need, for the reaction to occur as we want to explain it. So we'll, we'll look at that in a minute. So remember, when we have that positive charge in the oxygen, what that's really telling us is that the carbon is even more electron deficient. That we drew some resonance structures which showed that the positive charge can actually sit on the carbon. So the carbon is much more reactive now. So then we can take our alcohol of some description. So again, it's an R group, it doesn't matter what it is, but the most important thing is we've got that hydroxyl group, we've got that OH, and the oxygen has got a lone pair of electrons. 
And that lone pair of electrons is our nucleophile. And we don't have to have it charged because we've activated our carbonyl group. So we're going to take our electrons from our oxygen and we're going to attack the carbonyl carbon. And then the carbon would have five bonds, so we have to do something. And we all know what that is. We're going to break the carbon-oxygen double bond. And what that is going to give us is an OH at the top. We've still got our hydrogen. And we have our hydrogen at the bottom. Okay, so that's exactly the same reaction mechanism we've seen before. It's just now our nucleophile is an actual real life nucleophile. It's a, a hydroxyl group. Um, but we've seen we've got that proton. If you remember, the example I gave, we had a nucleophile with a hydrogen attached to it. Well, here is our nucleophile with a hydrogen attached to it. So the next thing we can do is we can deprotonate. We can remove that hydrogen from the, the OR group. So we can use the electrons from this bond in that OH. Okay. We can use the electrons. There we go. To neutralize that positive charge. And we end up what's called a hemiacetal. Now, if it was a ketone, so we've done it with an aldehyde, if it's a ketone, it would be called a hemiketal. Okay, that's on the lecture slides. Don't worry about it too much now, about the, the naming of it. Um, but it's just showing that you can add the alcohol group to the carbonyl. And of course, you can see all of that is reversible. We can take it all back the other way if we need to. So that's the acid catalyzed version. So that's exactly the same reaction mechanism we were looking at before in the general applied with a real life um, example, you know, a aldehyde and some um, alcohol group. But we can also base catalyze the same thing. Okay, so how do we do the base catalysis of it? Well, we've got our aldehyde and we would have our our alcohol. Now, if we had a base present, okay, the base would deprotonate that alcohol group. So this, again, is an equilibrium, would actually be our O minus. So again, it depends on the base you use, and we're not going to worry too much about that now, but if there's a base present, for under basic conditions, you can consider your alcohol to be deprotonated so instead of being ROH, it's just RO with a minus charge. And now you can see it fits into our general mechanism. We now have a charged nucleophile. We have an uncharged carbonyl, unactivated carbonyl, but those two things can, can work together, can react together. So the negative charge, the electrons here, will react with that carbonyl carbon. We've got too many bonds for the carbon now, so we need to break the carbon-oxygen double bond. Okay, and then you end up with a, an O minus up here. You've still got your hydrogen, and you've got the OR group. Okay. So at this step, so we've done the kind of the nucleophilic bit first. We've had the nucleophile attack. We've got that negative charge. We have some more alcohol in there. We might well have some other, you know, some water. We've got something else, but we can show it from the OH, the ROH, and we can then protonate here. So if we form a new bond with that proton, that hydrogen, it doesn't need its bond with the oxygen anymore, so it can give the electrons to the oxygen. And we end up with our tetrahedral sp3 hybridized um, hemi uh, acetal and of course we regenerate our base so it really is a base catalyzed reaction because that base 
that we've regenerated can go straight back to the start. And as I've shown you as, as we go, we have those equilibrium arrows in there to demonstrate that it's reversible. So what we'll do is we will very quickly go and look at the reversible reaction. So how does it reverse? So both of them reverse. So if we look at the acid catalyzed one first, so we've, we've started with our hemiacetal this time. Okay, so we start with that tetrahedral species to start with, and we're, it's acid catalyzed, so that means there's going to be some kind of proton in there. Okay. And so that proton um, can be used to protonate something. Now, you can look at that, and there are two things that can happen. One is you can actually protonate the OH group. Okay? So you've got the electrons up there. You can protonate the OH group, and that might well happen. It will be in equilibrium. Okay? But that, at this present moment, we're going to show the reverse of what we did. Doing that wouldn't show us the reverse reaction. It might happen. But what we know is that to protonate the OR group is what's going to give us the reverse reaction. So that's what we're going to do. Okay, so the electrons from the OR group, the lone pair of electrons, is going to react. Okay, we end up back here with our R group. Okay. So we've protonated that oxygen. That means it's got a positive charge because it's lost one of its electrons in this process. And at this stage, we can say, well, now can we reform our carbonyl bond? The answer is yes, we can. And the driving force behind why we can recreate that carbonyl bond is what we've created by protonating that OR group is we actually created something which is a good leaving group. So there is something which can leave from the carbon so in which case, we can reform that carbon-oxygen double bond, and at the same time, our, what is effectively going to become an alcohol can leave. And you can see that we've come back to our starting point. We've got our alcohol, and at the moment we've got our activated carbonyl group. And again, what we can do is we can deprotonate that to give us back our aldehyde. So that is just the reverse of the reaction that we've just gone through. And if you look back at the last lecture slide that we did um, this morning, that's the same reaction. It's just the reverse reaction. So the key thing you have to start getting into your mind is looking at these molecules and thinking, if I've got an acid present, where could I protonate? Okay. So there are multiple things you can do. And we will see as we get into more complex ones, there is this whole host of ways that you can do proton transfer. You can protonate and deprotonate almost at will. Um, but it's what you've got to get your mind into gear is doing the protonation that helps you to move your mechanism forwards. So the mechanism, the plan of this is that we're showing how we can go back to our starting material, so therefore we have to protonate in such a way that gets us back to the aldehyde that we started with. Okay, so that's a reverse reaction. You might all be sitting there thinking, why are we learning this? We're going to come on to that because there is some actual useful information here. We can base catalyze it as well. Okay, so we can do it the same, the reverse reaction under base catalysis. So again, if we do, we have our R group. We have our OH group up here. We have our hydrogen. And we have our OR. 
So if we have a base again, we're going to take sodium hydroxide, we're going to take an OH group as our base, and what we're going to show is that we can use this to remove that proton. What that means is the electrons that are in the oxygen-hydrogen bond are no longer needed by the hydrogen, so they, it gives them to the oxygen. The oxygen ends up with a negative charge. Okay. So we've taken our, our hemiacetal to start with. We've removed a proton from it, so we end up with this charged species. And then at this point, because we're under basic conditions, we can reform our carbonyl bond. That means carbon's got too many. But at this point, because the OR group can leave, because we're under basic conditions, it can. And we end up with an aldehyde and our alcohol. Now, in reality, the equilibrium often favours the carbonyl compound. Okay, so we sometimes in this instance, if we had a very um, kind of small, just a, a methyl aldehyde, we're very unlikely to be able to isolate the product. We know it can form. Okay, it's all in equilibrium, but actually the equilibrium would lie towards the carbonyl group, not towards the hemiacetal or the hemiketal. So how can we actually? improve the stability of that why does it become or when does it become relevant and that is what we can do is we can start thinking about doing intramolecular reactions so what we're doing at the moment is an intermolecular if you go back to your the structure and function we talked about inter and intramolecular bonding so at the moment we've got two species coming together so that's intermolecular if this reaction happened all in one molecule it would be intramolecular so how could we do that? Well, we could put it into some kind of cyclic product. Okay, and here's an example of what, how that might happen. You've got, at the start, CHO here. Okay, that is C, double bond O, H. So that is your, your aldehyde part of the molecule. Here we have your OH, so that is your alcohol. Okay, and those two things are reacting together. Now, if you have it in a four-membered ring, okay, you don't get any hemiacetal at all when you, when you look at the equilibrium. If you put it in a five-membered ring, you get nearly 90% of it actually survives, is, is present as a hemiacetal. When you make a six-membered ring, we're up to 95% of that material would be in the hemiacetal form. Once you go to a seven-membered ring, it starts dropping again. And there's lots of reasons why five and six-membered rings are more favourable. If you were doing a chemistry degree, we would absolutely be going into the detail about why, um, but you're not doing a chemistry degree, so all we need to know is that five and six-membered rings are, you know, are much more favourable for this. And actually doing a farm degree, hopefully you're already asking yourself or answering the question of why, especially if you've read through the notes because it's in the next slide. And that's talking about sugars. Okay, So a large number of natural sugars contain hemiacetals. And so therefore, that, those reactions which we've been talking about, they happen to these sugars. So they have the ability to act as a hemiacetal and be converted back to an aldehyde. But equally, they have the ability to be the aldehyde and cyclize into a hemiacetal. So this is a very old-fashioned, um, well not old-fashioned, it's a very sugar chemistry way of showing uh, the reaction with these kind of crossed bonds. And that's all to do with showing stereochemistry. Don't worry about that, it's just a way of showing it. But what you can see is, you can, under acidic conditions, you can protonate that at the top. Okay, so then you activate your... Um, your aldehyde, and then an OH group 
and in sugars you've got plenty of them to choose from but we know that five and six membered rings are favoured so the ones that form a five or six membered ring would, would do this will react with your aldehyde break the carbon oxygen double bond to create um, an OH group at the top and what that does is it forms these kind of sugars so here's an example of a pyranose form and what you can see is this wavy bond just denotes some stereochemistry don't worry about that too much now but what you can see is this portion here is equal to the the hemiacetal look you've got the oxygen you've got the oxygen so you've got oxygen here oxygen here you've got OH down here you've got OH over here you've got R groups here R groups here R groups here R groups here so a hemiacetal is a model for lots of stuff that goes on in sugars so what that means is sugars actually display carbonyl like reactions and so when we think of sugars and we think of you know there are lots of sugars in our body our body uses them for energy um, a lot of the reactions that might be going on are going to be these kind of carbonyl reactions where you might break open a ring for a sugar ring for a reason or you might want to couple sugar rings together to make um, disaccharides and trisaccharides yeah on the surface of cells we have these big complicated arrays of sugars that of, of glycosaccharides that are all linked together so understanding this acetal stuff actually does have an importance later on because you will, you will learn about these. Okay. So, let's see if any of that sunk in, shall we? So what I would like you to do is have a look at this and see if you can draw me the mechanism of the product of acetal formation, okay? So I want to see the product of this. 